I've written for television, film, radio, boarding, sprint ad. I've written all kinds of stuff. When did you start making money of doing content? When I was 19, there was like a three and a half lakh rupee paycheck that came in every month. Break down the anatomy of a video for me. What should I start doing? How should I think about the video? Being successful at long form content is the holy grail. If you could go to brands today who are trying to do YouTube and you can give them two or three pieces of advice, what would it be? I would tell brand managers to start off with short video. How much does a content creator of the 100k views make? How much does a content creator of the million views make? But if you're a top tier YouTuber, you're making more money than most actors that you see. They launched this thing called the OnePlus AI Music Studio. Wait, it's gonna just produce the track for you? Yeah. It makes a video also. Oh, that's cool. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever episode of OnePlus Open Conversations. Everyone was asking me, am I ever going to do a podcast? I didn't like the idea of a podcast. But I said, why not a five or six episode limited series? And I'll tell you what we're doing here. Every other podcast, it scratches the surface. Everyone talks about surface level stuff. But I said, what if we can go deeper? What if we can get the best people in each industry, go deeper and ask them what the future in their space is going to look like? So in this first episode, I brought on none other than Tanmay Bhatt. Tanmay has been known for creating exceptional content over a decade. He's been in many different industries. And it's very weird to see somebody win multiple spaces in content. And I want to bring on Tanmay and I didn't want to do a surface level conversation of how is it to be a content creator. I want to go deeper and I want to ask him questions like exactly how do you make a video? What is the anatomy of a video? How do you look at retention in a video? How much money to the exact rupee can you make as a content creator? And you know, some of these questions, when I ask these questions, I'm sure there's going to be some pushback and exact numbers won't be told, but I will dig for the exact numbers. There's also questions around how can you build creator businesses? How do creators monetize their businesses? How long do creators stick around? And how should brands think about content? We're going to go through all of it and much more in this video. So guys, why are we still recording me? Let's get to the pod. Usually, me and Tanmay are sitting down doing an episode of Overpowered. We're talking about all things AI. But today, Tamay, I don't want to talk about AI. Today, I have a dilemma. In the last year, I've been seeing every startup founder, every business start their own YouTube channel. Correct. Until like two years ago, YouTube was like a toy. Mm. Nobody ever took it seriously. Everyone said, ha, YouTube karta hai, ye wo. But this year, it feels like everyone's just taking it seriously. Everyone wants to be a creator. Businesses want to be creators, which is the most weird scenario to ever be in. Yeah, very 2023. Very 2023. But then again, you are the OG. You've been around for like... OG is just a good way of saying old. <laughs> I realized. Old and gold. You've been sure. around for a decade. You've done this in repeated formats. You've won gaming. You've won uh, streaming. You've won uh, AI. Like, and I began with podcasting actually. A lot of people don't realize. You began with podcasting? In 2010, AI, we began as a podcast. That's how we started. Interesting. So just tell me about the initial journey. Like how did you get in? Like why did you even decide to do content? I started off as a television writer... And then stand-up was happening. In 2008 and 9, right out of college, I started writing for TV, television. Dude, I've written everything from India's Got Talent to Natsle with Saroj Khan to uh, MTV, What's Up? The Voice of Youngistan. I used to write all that stuff. And then I watched um, I watched Russell Peters and I said, hey, I want to do that. Hmm. And I started doing that. How old were you when you were doing this? I was started writing for television when I was 18, 19. And then saw stand-up and then I had some money left over from television. Then I met Kamba while doing stand-up. And Kamba was really inspired by this podcast called WTF with Mark Marin, which was the original um, comedy podcast where he would document comedians' lives, etc., etc., etc. A really cool podcast for those who want to check it out. There's an episode with WTF with Mark Marin where Mark Marin interviewed Robin Williams and Robin Williams spoke about his addiction issue for the first time on a podcast. Like hmm. At that point, imagining a mainstream personality like Robin Williams talk about their addiction on television seemed unimaginable. And that's when the spark hit me saying, yo, this is like an alternative medium that doesn't confine to the rules of traditional media. So then I started listening to the podcast and I was like, this is really cool. We should do this for India. It was Kamba's idea. And then I just joined him and we started off with no video, audio only podcast is pre geo time, uh, audio only podcast sitting like this in a literally we used to be at a sound and did you call it AIB back then we called it AIB back then yeah that was the first thing and the logic with that was if people are okay with the name they'll be okay with the content hmm. uh, which back in 2010 we started the podcast in 2010 I remember 
So yeah, you were you were you were praising me. Please continue. Yeah, no, yeah. I was not praising you. I was asking you for your story, right? There seems to be a big shift that's happened in your life from, hey, I was doing television writing for a company. Now I want to do stand up. Now I want to start my own channel. Mm. What's the big shift to taking it seriously? What's the point where you were like, I'm now starting to see some money out of this? I think before money also there has to be PMF for enjoyment. And what's PMF? Could you explain it? Product to market fit. Uh, Sorry, it's, it's Bangalore terms that I've now used. Uh, PMF for enjoyment comes first, then PMF for business comes right after. First question is, do you actually enjoy doing it? Because most people do it now because it's the thing to do. Hmm. But most people aren't suited for podcasts or even content creation. They don't enjoy doing it necessarily, but they think that this is the thing to do. Um, you don't want to do it for just the likes uh while the upsides of distribution are massive uh being a being a full time creator is as much of a job and a profession but more unstable and more like you you're, you're not going you know you don't have a monthly paycheck so you don't quite know so the way to jump into it i would say is first find pmf for passion and enjoyment and when did you find that as in school only dude i always enjoyed i was uh, I, my english teacher told me that she loved my i was not a bright student until the 6th standard and in the 7th standard something changed my english teacher told me that she gave me the highest in my english essay she gave mm. me like whatever 10 on 10 and she made me stand in front of the class and she said that i want to let the whole class know that he has scored the highest because for originality mm. and do teachers really make a difference actually when you're young and that impression she said he is the most original of everybody in class and baki sabne ratta maar ke essay chapa hai but he wrote something original and that's why and that's why i was like oh originality matters and I didn't even know that you could be validated for having bizarre thoughts. And what about the paycheck? Like, when did you start making money of doing content? Like, money where you were like, hey, at least, ghar ka, you know. I mean, I was writing for television, which back in the day, in 2010, I was, I, I would get paid, um, twelve thousand rupees for story, twelve thousand rupees for screenplay, twelve thousand rupees for dialogue, or some something. How much does like that this. come out to per month? About eight or nine of these a month. So. And when I was nineteen, there was like a three lakh rupee, three and a half lakh rupee paycheck. All of a sudden, that came in every month. So, and I had this gig was like five, six months. So all of a sudden, I saw like ten, twelve lakh rupees come in, and that at that point, like there was as much money as my dad was making. So it was insane. So it freaked me out. Realizing, think, oh, this is crazy. In fact, that paycheck helped me take the next leap to stand up, where I was making no money, which was two thousand bucks a night for a show at whatever you know bar in Sake or whatever it is. but i was already writing content and i saw the big bucks so to say early on and god bless the producers who also enabled me to take that kind of thing because they were also like he's a young kid who's different from the rest and he's original or whatever so to say that's why they were able to pay me that much i was writing a daily sitcom for disney and abi saw its first real check from our first live show we started selling out 2000 seater auditoriums around the country and Do the math, right? Two thousand into roughly three ninety nine, four ninety nine average ticket. How much is that? Whatever, six lakh, seven lakh rupees split between the four of us minus costs. So the, I think two thousand and twelve was the first year when I started seeing significant money. I think we probably made ten, twelve lakhs that year. But it took you like probably three, four years to catch up to the paycheck that you were making at your previous yes. company. Yes. Yes. My previous gig as a television writer took about th- took about three, four years. Uh, but I had savings from my previous gig. That's why I was able to give that. Three four years of, you know, transition to new media. Um, that's why even now I tell people saying first find find if you enjoy doing it and if you're able to do it for three years without really feeling like I want to go back to my job, unless you're doing it full time and you're aggressively outputting so much, you can really make content while you have another job. No, hmm. you can. It's not it's not that hard. I think you're able to take time out. So I think that's the advice I would give most people. Take your time. Do it while you're doing a job. and then once you think that okay i can go a year just doing nothing else but this then you take that leap one of the things about creating content that i've seen right you've just been around for very long but it's not been the same tanmay like it's not today is not ai bhi tanmay it's very different thank lord thank right? the lord for that hmm. right so it feels like and it's not like it's just one jump right it's been several jumps hmm. it's almost like you've never settled yeah so, that's true <laughs> so so the question is What was the driving factor behind those jumps? A and B. Do other people also need to do that to stay relevant long term? Oh, hundred percent. I think. 
I think I got really lucky because, dude, if you can write content really well, you understand the basics of how content works. And if you understand the basics, then you're able to, the principles of making content don't change across mediums. I've written f- for television, film, radio, uh, I've written hoardings, print ads, jingles, songs, YouTube videos, I've written corporate shows, I've written all kinds of stuff. You know, it's a very interesting insight, I'll tell you why. The average person on the internet looking at Tanmay will think, hey, Tanmay is funny. Tanmay is an improv comedian. But what I'm hearing is there's just so much writing behind what you do. Years and years of, years of writing. Like a decade of non-stop output. Dude, I worked with, in Veer's company, Weird Ass, where we outputted like seven or eight uh, 90-minute live comedy shows. Then I wrote like 300 sketches for AIB. Before that was three, four years of daily sitcom writing for Disney. Before that was all the writing I did in college and school. So really all of this put together is now me today where it feels second nature. But it's years of writing. That's what I'm saying. If you understand how to write and construct, then you can do this sort of stuff in in your sleep. Um, I've said this before, which is your ability to exercise judgment only get stronger if your feedback loops are shorter and faster. If you're able to create something out of thin air, put it in front of an audience, have the audience respond, and then go reiterate. If you do this hundreds and thousands of times over, only then do you really get good at your job. Um, Which most people aren't able to do that either because their job doesn't allow them to. But this is like, as I heard Sonu Nigam say on Beer Biceps podcast recently, which I thought was a good phrase, ki chabana zaruri hai. You have to spend your time just chewing the craft of whatever it is that you're doing. So if you're a good content creator, how much writing do you think per year the work entails? Like, is it a book's worth? Is it two books worth? It's 10 books worth at least. So about a thousand pages a year? Thousand pages a year. Yeah, I would be outputting a thousand pages a year. Easy. Cumulatively, yeah. Off off the thousand pages, maybe a hundred or fifty would be usable. But you got to put out that thousand pages. Is there scope for a content creator who can't write? Who just wants to do everything improv? Yeah, there is. There is. You can, you can be that sort of a person. But know that it, if you're going to improvise your way through or if you're going to make content, then you're not going to be really good until you make like a thousand hours of content. Like you just have to output that much for you to get really good at what you do. But why, why is it important to make content? What are the benefits of making content today? Like why are businesses doing it? And should a business owner or should an employee of a business watching this make content either personally or as the business first let's talk about why individuals should make content i think nusair put this very well which is in the old day you could either be a doctor or you could be a lawyer right today is the generation of ands which is you can be a doctor and something else you can be a lawyer and something else and more often than not this is doctor and content creator with it for individuals the upside is very clear it's Every piece of media that you output online could have asymmetric, could have any asymmetric bet. Uh, there's the novel tweet, which is what are some things that have asymmetric returns? Reading a book has asymmetric returns. Going on a date has as- asymmetric returns. What is an asymmetric return for the which audience? Which means most things in life have symmetrical returns, which is if you do X, then you get X returns. Hmm. You keep doing this and there's linear growth. Mm. This is what most people experience in a job also, which is if you're renting your time out, every year the amount of rent increases. If you're working out, then the more you work out, the more your muscles increase. Asymmetric returns is where if you put in X, you could get any output. It could be really, really dramatically bigger than what you thought. So let's take an example, right? If you go out on 10 dates, going out on a date and meeting someone new has asymmetrical asymmetrical returns. How? Only one out of these 10 needs to be so compatible with you. You could find a life partner. Hmm. Imagine spending 15 hours and getting a life partner. Like that's a dramatically outsized return. Like you got something insane. Hmm. Imagine reading a book and you get a startup idea or you get a a way to think that changes your life dramatically. Like a live example is I read a book called The Obesity Code by Jason Fung. I read it twice, three times over. Since then I've lost like 58 kilos. That one book just changed how I think and I probably saved myself five or six years. That's why making media gives you asymmetric, asymmetrical returns because you don't know who's going to watch it at the other end. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when media was centralized, if you made something, it would go linearly. 
today because media is decentralized it's almost like veins arteries in your heart right like you don't know where it ends up with so imagine you put out a tweet about a certain insight about your profession that tweet has say 900 views hmm. of those 900 one of them could be varun maya or tanmay bhat right? hmm. and you see this and you go like oh this this person is interesting i'm just going to follow so you can't control like you don't know who's going to be at the other end would would a better way to put this be that a lot of success is luck like a lot of inbound deal flow is luck but yeah. creating distribution increases your surface increases area your of chances luck. of luck aib's example is really uh, is really interesting here how did we get access to movie stars as aib ashish shakya used to write a column for hindustan times used to write a humor column for hindustan times he used to write for every week for years right and then twitter happened and he joined twitter and then he started putting out these columns on twitter one day kalki followed him because he she just happened to read the article she really liked it next week we wrote a sketch and we directly dm kalki saying hey would you like to would you like to be be in the video we made that video and that's another piece of media that we output that that went viral next day we are on barkhadat show that like an arjun kapoor or someone saw it and then followed us on twitter then once arjun and ranveer singh followed us on twitter that led to ab knockout right like it's you couldn't have predicted you couldn't have planned there's it. just no way you, there's just no way you could have planned it but it mm-hmm. wouldn't have happened if ashish shakya didn't write that column he was outputting it every week it me and khamba would not have met if khamba wasn't tweeting funny jokes dude me and rohan met because of because of outputting media rohan was a columnist at jlt and i used to love that magazine so i followed uh, i followed rohan then i followed his blog then one day rohan spoke about um, hey there's an opening here or whatever and then i applied through that and then me and rohan met through that hmm. so i think a lot most of my um, lucky um serendipitous moments all have happened because of someone has outputted something into the world and it just happened to reach me and i think every individual should have that opportunity by by just put out your stuff in the in the world and the arteries will carry it to someone or the other and the algorithms are just trying to determine how fast you can your content can flow that's why you need to understand how platforms work so you can maximize your asymmetric bet interesting and do you feel like at bigger and bigger levels of scale at your dizzying level levels of scale do you feel like the compounding there is incredible like these lucky moments that you're pulling off do you think absolutely. it absolutely and and how does it work for a brand what is the usefulness for a company let's say i run a d2c company what's the point your best hires could come from your content um zomato makes really killer content right like so akshar started off making content zomato now zomato's team is so strong because there are creative people around the country who would see zomato's work and be like they make really cool shit i want to work there hmm. the right. same things happen with cred same things happen with cred now it's become aspirational to wanna to wanna wanna work there so if a business makes good content it has outsized returns just from a attracting quality talent and it's not just that you know if you make good content as a company it increases nps of employees who work at that company you know how cool it feels if you're if you work at a company and on your friend whatsapp group someone shares an instagram post saying have you seen this is really cool you get to be in that group and be like yo this is the company that i work for money can't buy that you can't run performance advertising and buy that kind of NPS. so you're saying content increases or improves culture internal culture 100% uh, employee nps dude people feel proud of um when you when you work for a brand that makes good content a good example is i was talking to sashank who runs the whole truth right the whole con- the whole company is so passionate about what they do uh it's because of so much so much has to do with the content that they output it's not just that dude it's not just the content quality is really good when when content is really good then the comments are really good when comments are really good you start feeling pride in pride and joy in what you do if you feel pride and joy in what you do you, you put in harder. 120% it's all connected so having a cool brand uh, that does cool content has effects that you cannot you like you can't put that on on paper it's hard to judge a lot of companies will fret over like i keep telling them like okay if it's if the budget for something is like 50 lakhs roi has to be 50 roi lakhs. has to be whatever it is i'm like ye to ek do lakh rupaye idhar to chhod na like you know having a good relationship with the people who are making the stuff for you all that stuff matters because relationships are everything like i would i would happily take a hit for 5 lakhs if i can work with a company where the process of working 
was way easier. I, I actually can verify that because I've seen that behind the scenes. Tanmay doesn't think so much about the cash if he's looking at a company and he really likes the company. I'm just like, it's, it'll just be a breeze to work with these guys. And like, you want to you you have minimal one-night stands and more relationships with, with this sort of stuff. So let's move to the next piece, right? I wanted this to be like a masterclass in making content. Break down the anatomy of a video for me. I think there are two kinds of videos roughly, right? There's a long form video, maybe yeah. 10, 20, 30 minutes. And then there's short form videos, one minute. Yeah. I'm a new, I'm a kid. I want to win at the content game. Yeah. I have the ability to do long form and short form. Yeah. Let's say I'm a, I, I make for a daily uh, living, I go to school and I make some money on the side. Maybe I'm doing some freelance gigs or something. What should I start doing? What, what kind of content should I start making? How should I think about the video? Look, Long form content is being successful at long form content is the holy grail, right? Why is that the holy grail over short form? Uh, it's pretty simple. You want people to watch you many times for longer periods of time. Okay, let's take, I've seen 30 Shah Rukh Khan movies, which means I've spent, you know, 150, 200 hours of Shah Rukh Khan on the big screen. Uh, I made the effort of leaving my house, going to the theater, paying for the ticket and then watching him which means I put in so much effort to watch this guy. And at the end of it, I really liked it. That's why now I, if Shah Rukh Khan is in front of me, I will palpitate, right? Um, now the friction to consuming long form is, it's it's obviously not similar, but there is more friction to con to uh, convince people to watch long form videos. It's a time commitment. I have to watch it. I have to have context built up. I have to really And there's also double opt-in, right? With short changes appear on their feed. Here, you have, to click. Feed. Here you have to click. So if people put in effort to watch you, a, do, getting them to do that is higher. So if you get them to do that, they're likely to, and if they do this three, four, five times over, they're likely to like you more. Plus, if someone watches you for longer, it just means that they like you more. Like it's as simple as that. Short video, like you said, short video is a scrolling habit, which is you just happen to show up on their feed, you're editing them for 30 seconds. And unless that 30 seconds is so good, they're not coming to your profile and then watching 10 other videos. Even if you do short form video, if you are able to be a format that someone watches you once and they go to your profile and they watch 10 of those videos, then you truly make an impression. You make more of an impression if you last in front of someone's eyes for longer. It's as simple as that. Having said that, that is the holy grail of long form. But if you like, I would optimize for finding PMF for passion and enjoyment, right? And you don't enjoy it if you're not doing well. If you make content and nobody sees it, you don't enjoy the process. You're like, what am I doing wasting wasting my time? So if you're going to start out, I would recommend short form because likelihood of you finding some traction and getting that first dopamine hit of, ah, someone saw my shit. That is higher in short form. Hmm. So if you're just starting out, you want to try and get your first, you know, thousand views on a short form video. And getting your first thousand views, uh, you need to make a half decent video, get, get all your friends to share it on their story, and let the algorithm do its thing. How many friends? If you had to put a number on it? Let's say how many of our friends? Like 10, 20? Have. Yeah, if you 10, 20. Depends on how many followers they have, hmm. you know. But if one of your friends is Varun Maya and has 200,000 followers on Instagram, then that's just Varun Maya is enough. So it's not how many yes. friends. It's just about increasing your odds of letting the, letting the, how many, sorry, did I get 200,000 wrong? Is it, yeah. is, how much is it? It's 400. 400,000. Sorry, bye bye. <laughs> um, so it's, Dhoni said this recently. We, I asked him on a thing saying, would you pick uh, someone who's talented or confident? He said, I would always pick the guy who's, who's feeling more confident because the odds of success of someone who feels confident is much higher. You can have, you can have a lot of talent, but if you're not feeling good, you're likely not going to succeed. Hmm. Um, so I think confidence inspires luck in some sense, right? So if you're starting out, I want you to feel confident. I want you to feel cocky and feel like I got this. I'm actually going to crush it. Maybe cocky is not the right word, but I want you to feel inspired. And if you want to feel inspired, likelihood of success is higher in short form. So start short form and then eventually see how you can pivot that audience into doing something long form. It's harder to build a strong community on short form. Have you changed your mind on short form? I have. I have. Um, I, I wasn't a fan of short form stuff a couple of years ago. Since then, a bunch of things Why? changed. I had a big problem with doing short form on YouTube because there was no way for you to do short form and long form on one channel without it either looking ugly. YouTube suffers from a disease where a channel's purpose is unidimensional. 
people subscribe to a channel because they expect A or X out of this channel. So you can't do multiple different formats on a channel? Back in the day. Now YouTube changed it to you can literally each channel can do long form videos. They have a podcast button. So under the same channel, you can also do podcasts. Under the same channel, you can also do shorts. Earlier when I subscribed to a channel, I was subscribed to a type of content. Now when I subscribe to a channel, I've subscribed to this brand of content. So as a creator, I now have more options. I will show up either as a as a podcast on the podcast feed or as shorts on the shorts feed. So now the product is much better. So now I think if you're doing 100K views, for example, uh, if you're doing 100K views and if you also do shorts with it, you your likelihood of getting that 1 million views is higher on a short than on that 100K views. Again, this is, this is like the algorithm and all that stuff is like it's complicated and you know there are many variables to it. But anecdotally, this is this is what I sense. I change my view on short form primarily because it's my sense is it's easier, lower effort to bang out that one minute, one minute video, um, and your chances of hitting that one golden fifty million view is higher in short form because you get to take more shots. If if you can make five short form videos a day, but really it takes you a week to make one long form video. You want to start off with short form because if you take 50 shots, one of them is going to hit. So you change your mind on shots because you did see outcomes and at the same time you feel like it's much easier to produce. So short form, while you say, while, the reason why I said, said this was that quote unquote short form is not easy. It's easier than to produce. Things. It's easier to produce. Like the barrier to entry to short form is, is a lot easier hmm. than producing a slightly higher quality long form video. It just takes lesser time to edit. It just takes lesser time to edit. Now on Instagram, like Instagram basically killed in shorts, right? Like I don't know if you saw, but now you can make a reel and it's as good as in shorts within Instagram. You can, I remember in college, you know that editing timeline, it used to be, okay, this is video, this is audio and transitions would be little things in the middle all this is on your fucking phone now it's insane like i'm i'm using basically fcp on my phone at this point and you once told me something about the anatomy of a video you used to give me the example of buzzfeed tasty yeah where you said that actually i let you explain it you should tell the audience what makes a good video what does the algorithm look for at the heart of whether it's long form short form television shows movies at the heart of it it's all the same can i retain the viewer till the end it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. The example that I gave was Tasty. Tasty would begin with like, it would be top down video of like the first a plate would come in and then, you know, that'd be the base of a pizza. Then the cheese would go on top of it and they'd chop the whatever pepperoni and it'd go on top of it. Then the thing goes, goes outside frame and you know, it, it's blank. You see a shot of it going inside the oven, when it comes out, it's finally ready and you're waiting for that golden shot of lifting the pizza like this and the fucking cheese and all of all of it is there. From the beginning of the video, there was a promise that something cool is going to happen in the end and this is what makes retention go up really high. Let's take Overpowered as an example, right? The first two episodes of Overpowered was what? Us like theorizing about AI and it was a lot of like just us talking until eventually I was like, let's just make this tasty, which is let's just demo AI tools because AI tools are inherently like making a pizza. At the start of it, it's like, hey, this tool promises you to do X, Y, Z. Now let's watch it in action. And that's that's the aha moment, the oven moment, which is like, oh, it's it's ready. Isn't that isn't that insane? That's a nice word, the oven moment. The oven moment. It's it's where you wait for the oh, this happens. And if you notice, every single trend on Instagram is basically this. The oven moment. The oven moment, which is build up anticipation, deliver on that anticipation. It's every single trend is this. Take Moe Moe, Moe Moe. Like when a Moe, when, when a reel shows up and I see below there's this, that Moe Moe song ka thing is going on. I just know that, oh, all this bullshit dialogue is going to eventually end up with like five people doing Moe Moe at the end of it, right? Every single trend is basically this. Whether it is the thing above your head saying which movie character are you, whether it is, you know, put your head on my shoulder where it flips to a silhouette of you in like whatever. Every single trend is something cool is going to happen in the end. I feel like YouTube has gone from, you know, your subscriber numbers don't matter as much as they did back in the day because now I have subscribed to like 300 channels. When I open YouTube, it's not going to recommend. Off those 300 channels on a Thursday evening, if I open YouTube, there are like 50 different things I've consumed on YouTube where the YouTube algorithm is like, he's interested in these 50 different things. 
very low on the priority is the channels that he has subscribed to. Maybe if I've subscribed to a channel and watched more than four videos, will it even continue recommending that video to me? Um, but yeah, packaging packaging matters for retention. Like you can get someone to watch your video, subscribe. But if you want to retain them, you got to get them to click like three more times. Only then does you the algorithm feel like this person should be shown overpowered video often. Overpowered could have 300,000 subscribers, but we have variable views, right? Like some episodes do 200k views, some episodes do 50k views. That has stopped mattering as much. It's the it's what happened with TikTok. On TikTok, you could have 10 followers, but you could have three, eight million plus view uh, shorts, but your follower could go from 10 to just 300. It doesn't matter. I think that's slowly happening to YouTube as well. As platforms get more saturated, things get even more uneven, which is a good thing. I think variable rewards in life are... Dude, variable rewards is what makes uh, the rat continue running on the treadmill. There's this really interesting experiment that was done at Stanford. They took like a bunch of rats, they put them in water, and they, they were all like trying to swim, trying to make sure that they don't die. Then after 20 minutes, they took the rats out and they dried them and they made them feel like, okay, you're, you're fine now. Then five minutes later, they put them back into water. Okay. Mm. How long do you think the rats kept paddling to be alive? How long? I assume the fact that they kept pulling them out gave the rats hope yes. in a way. Yes. And the water restraint stress, this is called the water restraint stress test. Right? Ah. So yeah, you okay. keep dumping the rat into water, but if you leave it in the water, it eventually gives up. Yeah. But if you keep taking it out, the rat is still like, at some point, I'm going to be taken out. Why don't they survive for five days? Mm. Five days, they kept paddling. Right? This is what variable rewards does. So it's in every platform's interest to give the creator variable rewards. Mm. Because if you get one success, then you think that the next video could be the next success. The next video after that could be it. You just need to see one 10K views and then you're like, bro, this is golden. I'm there. You just need that first one. Hmm. Like ever since we got 12 million on that one overpowered reel, every video <laughs> you want it to be that. Hmm. So you just know that that's what's possible. Tanmay, hmm. how much money do content creators make? And I think you should you should tabulate it into how much does a content creator of the 100k views make? How much does a content creator of the million views make? And if you're working with brands, does your subscriber count actually matter? If you get 100k views on short video, either on Instagram, you make no money. If you have short video on YouTube, it's minuscule, right? Like you could get 10 million views and get a 2000 rupee payout. Like it's short video doesn't, the short video revenue revenue on all the platforms is minuscule next to nothing. So you can't make a, you can't make a living based on advertising revenue through short video. On long form, your RPM, which is revenue per mille, which is how much money are you getting per thousand monetized playbacks on YouTube can range anything between whatever, 50 to 150, depending on the genre you are in. So if it's if it's on the lower end, I suspect like um, genres like gaming or vlogging would be on the lower end because the audience for that is more generic, could be younger as well. So whatever, do the math, right? If you, if you get a million views, then maybe you have whatever, 500, 600,000 of those be monetized. So 500 into uh, whatever, 50, 60, 100, 150, that's, that's the kind of numbers you would see. If you have a more premium audience, which is, for example, like if you have, a, if you have 100,000 subscribers, but say 2,000 of those subscribers are YouTube premium viewers, hmm. uh, then you get more. YouTube premium just means that someone who is paying to not have ads on on YouTube, a view from that person generates more. So, um, so it really, it really depends on what genre you're in. Like if you if you do finance stuff, I know finance stuff pays uh, the revenue. R RPMs on finance videos are a lot higher. Uh, RPMs on podcasts are also pretty high uh, because in an in an hour long podcast, if someone if your average view time is thirty minutes, which you're is getting multiple high, ads, you're getting multiple ads. So each view you generate a lot more you know, 2x, 3x. But tell me a rough view. number, no? Like, forget about RPM. Tell me like a creator maybe in comedy who has a million subscribers or let's say in gaming who has a million subscribers. What can they expect from, what, what do they see on their channel dashboard? If you get a million views, uh, on the higher end, you'll make one lakh rupees. On the higher end is what I've noticed. So let's, this, let's say they make, they're putting out four videos a month. So they're getting making four lakhs from YouTube. They could. If they're making, if they're getting a million views, they could 
on the higher end. One million views, one lakh, uh, one lakh rupees is on the higher end. Uh, but if you get like, you should be able to make at least like 30, 40, 50, 60 K in that range. You should be able to make that irrespective of the genre you are in. But all, it's like, this is like, I'm still talking about if you get these as an established creator, because all of this depends on, you know, is the sales team pushing your channel as something that, uh, the, whose inventory gets pocketed off. If you are a partnered, partnered channel at YouTube, if you fall in the light, right genre where, for example, you're in, um, towards the end of the year, ad sales go up a lot more because brands have more money to push their products. Um, then more channels have more inventory uh, filled up. Uh, but yeah, if, if you're generating a million views, then you're probably going to get more money from brand deals than YouTube ad revenue. Uh, but if you get a million views in, say, a finance category, if you can charge upwards of 15, 20 lakhs, per integration this is not like youtube paying you money this is you going to a brand and saying i hey, will you, talk about your yeah. thing for a minute yeah, yeah yeah yeah. if you're an established creator and you do short form also like i know creators who are charging 15 lakhs to make even a reel mm. um i know creators who who who've been paid like 35 40 lakhs to make a reel like i've like the the deals really de- depends on who you are what is your brand how premium are you who are the people who are managing you what so you're your, saying it's less about the views or it's a mix of the views and what people think of and they think about you. What people think of you. What It's a mix of views, what genre you're in and what is your perception as as a creator. Like I know, I know creators who don't do that many deals and they'll just be like, listen, I'm going to do like five deals a year and it's going to come at a premium and I'm only, only going to work with, you know, the Coca-Cola's of the world, which is like top tier brand. So I know creators like that also. But I know other creators who are like, dude, I'm producing like 80 videos a year. This is inventory that's going waste. uh, That's going waste. I might as well monetize. Just take it deal by take it deal by deal. So (laughs) there's no there's no direct like, oh, if you do X, then you get Y. Really depends on who you are, what your brand is. So at a million views a video, let's say four videos a month I'm producing and I'm producing maybe say 20 shots a month. You think it's possible for me to make a million dollars a year? As if I was a new, let's just say, twenty-year-old content ad, creator. From ad revenue, unlikely. But yeah, if you're pulling, I think if you're pulling in whatever upwards of 25, 30 million views a month on YouTube, uh, which would put you in like the top two, three percentile creators. Zero point one. That's top zero point one percent. Yeah, top zero point one percent. I'm talking views which are not shorts driven. Views which are purely long form. If you're able to pull in thirty million views a month with an average watch time of you know five to six minutes, you are you will make a million dollars a year uh, between branded content and ad revenue. It's possible. It's very, very much possible to do that. Uh, but if if you are a YouTuber scoring big numbers on long form consistently, then dude, you don't even need to be dependent on branded content after a point, right? Like you, you can pull in, uh, you can pull in like 20, 30 lakhs a month on YouTube if you're pulling in, you know, that many views. Uh, you're basically earning the salary of a CEO comfortably mm. um, so it's it's possible to make really good money on youtube but it's a grind like then your your job is you're you're available 365 days you have to produce content whenever absolutely your life is on sale i've seen creators who get to the scale who just don't want to work with brands anymore oh, really yeah like, like they make enough money just it's not it's not about the money it's more about like sometimes it's difficult to work with brands yeah right so many of those creators decide i want to start a business now yeah which have is you, which is a smarter route to take. But have you seen any successful creator business in India? The jump from creator to service businesses is pretty easy. I've seen fewer successes in D2C. It's because if you're a very successful creator, the odds of you making so much money from just brands is mm. higher. Uh, whereas the odds of starting a business and really putting in the effort to make that successful, it takes it takes a lot of commitment and effort. The model that I've seen work with a lot of creators is you know, you become successful as a public brand, then you find and team up with a co-founder who has the expertise in a particular business. So your job becomes more about creating network effects, really leveraging your your position, creating top of funnel for, for the business. Uh, but I think top of funnel is also diminishing. There's only so many times will your audience, unless you keep generating newer audiences, uh, like someone like a Dhruv Rati will generate newer audiences all the time because he talks about basically what's in the news, right? And everybody cares about the news. So you see, Anything that happens in the news is a new audience that that comes to watch him. 
um but if you are like if you are a creator like me i have a very loyal um low attrition kind of audience which is people will come watch watch like you know six videos by me every month so if i tell you to click on one it's unlikely you're going to click on it more than once so it really depends on the kind of creator that you are but there are different models you can do you can be a creator and monetize your audience which is you can either sell courses or you can you know teach something you can do whatever it is you can be a creator and start a new business this could be a t2c business it could be a service business or if you're a creator and you find a partner and run multiple businesses like i fall into the third category which is um i now have a wide range of interests and i have access in different areas and then i find co-founders in different but that areas. also works for you because you have channels in different areas that are all working yes i have channels in different areas and more importantly my range of interest is fairly wide i'm interested in content also i'm interested in ai also i'm interested in you know startups angel investing d2c brand i'm interested in a bunch of things um so i can speak the language and i can really communicate with founders that i work with in that language but it's not for everyone but if you are a successful creator there the part to making money there are there are many as long as you are able to keep your public brand sustained if you could go to brands today who are trying to do youtube i'm talking about companies and you can give them two or three pieces of advice what would it be because you worked with so many brand managers who get youtube wrong i would tell brand managers to start off with short video because i think uh you you're able to your feedback loop is faster brand managers will really know you know what kind of content suits their brand so i would say first start with dip your feet in short video create a dedicated team how much should they budget i mean it's it's at least five hires right you'll need you'll need one brain one or two brains either what would you call that role um, like a creator in residence let's say creator in residence or let's call them both producers okay. talent and producer okay sometimes the producer is the talent sometimes producer is separate and talent is so separate. presenter and producer That's presenter it. producer um then i i'd probably say two editors and if you want an in house camera production person then you can have that and or you can rent so like a that. director of production director of production or you can also rent that the, the producer can do it uh, but it's tough for a producer to manage the content also and the production also like we are very lucky to have sagar who can who can do bit of both but most people aren't able to do that uh, depends on the kind of content you're doing so if you're doing like finance videos for example your producer will really focus on what is the content that you're that you're making the scripts really matter because you talk about money and you want to be careful with what what you say publicly uh, but say you you're making food videos so a producer can think of formats and just set up the production in place and outsource the production and uh then really go ahead. so tell me the exact math how much should i spend on a studio like I, i'm a brand i need to produce a short form video every day i would say if you're a brand just starting out you want to outsource production initially do a pilot where you outsource production but have the key stakeholders which is the producer the five people yeah not the five people includes two editors but you can outsource that also but i think you need to have an in-house producer slash brand custodian who will really think of what is the content that's going to go out um rest everything you can outsource in the beginning you can use a company like aos which is you know uh, varun nai and a bunch of other cool people at avr involved in you can outsource it do a pilot i think really what you need as a brand to make content is intent and one person to own it be the brand custodian who has the best judgment on this content suits my brand the rest you can outsource how do you find that person oh the best people to for this job are people who have built distribution themselves i think they are the best people to be running the ship for you um if you haven't done content before then you're going to make some bad decisions if you are responsible to to deploy dollar on producing content so i think creators would be a good bet i think most companies eventually there'll be enough creators in the market who could not make big top dollars as creators um but they would make for killer uh, content marketing people inside companies yeah i think i think more brands should be hiring creators in house for sure uh even if it's if even if it's not permanently i think even as a consultant uh cuz your content team really needs to think like a like a creator it's not a, it's not it's not something you can half ass it's not making content is an always on job it's not a ipl rai mein campaign banata hu you know december rai mein campaign banata hu it is all year long so it's not a it's not a half ass it's you can't half ass it you got to be on it all the time that's why i think more people will hire creators what is what is your team composed of right now uh, what does your team look like primarily editors and one producer i have two editors and one producer for my youtube so three people 
Three people is for my YouTube. I mean, doing uh, like camera setup and stuff. The producer does that. I do everything on Zoom, so I don't got to do it. I got to do nothing. Uh, I have one producer whose job is to curate the content for me. What I what I react to. Then on the podcast side, I have a producer and, and an editor. Then on the agency front, there is you know couple of writers and me and Devya who are the co-founders. Um, and that's on, Moonshot. That's Moonshot. Then on Overpowered, there's you know there's we have two editors and and a producer. Uh, so they're all small small teams like uh, pods. Highly efficient, you know, sing, single focus on on what they're doing. It becomes hard if you get one person to context switch with all the different things that I'm doing. It's hard for one person to to be able to do all of that. Um, so yeah, teams in in silos with a singular focus on on what they're doing. Interesting. Yeah. Now, man, this was fantastic. I learned so much, and you know, I always keep saying this, right? I think proximity to a good creator makes you a good creator. Like I, I know there are creators who who you know gone solo and won really big, but I think that takes a long time. It takes like five six years. But I think the minute you spend time very closely with a bigger creator and you see them do their thing behind the scenes, I think it accelerates your career. If you ever want to be a creator or want to create content, yeah, you are the product of the five ten people you surround yourself with. So I think I've learned so much from being around you, and I just wanted to make sure that the audience also got to hear some of our behind the scenes conversation. Hope it was useful, and if it wasn't, then please write "Kitna Gyan Dega Tanmay," and <laughs> I'm sure someone will afford that comment. So then, by the way, we have a ritual here. This is the first episode, and I want to make this like a habit for the next. I just want to do like a five six episode series, and then be done. Okay. We give everyone a gift. Actually, this is the OnePlus Open. This is the OnePlus Open. You using you're using the phone, right? What do you like about it? It has all the benefits of a tablet. Mm. It has all the benefits of a phone. And if I ever get bored of the tablet view, like I'm, I get bored very quickly. So it's like I really like this. I love how it feels when you when you fold it. And There's no the the crease is almost invisible. Yeah. Like all the other ones, they're like crease. This one's like invisible. It's really nice. And I heard the camera is stellar. This is a collaboration with Hasselblad. Yeah, check this out. Hmm. I can do this really cool thing on a on the camera. Okay. Hmm. Oh, the dual view. Yeah. You can have the back camera and the front camera. This is perfect for vlogging. I'm recording you, but you can see what's being recorded. Oh, that's cool. So I can record as and is. you can also see it. Oh, this is great actually to shoot reels and stuff. Yeah. So if your producer is recording you, you know exactly what's being recorded. At the same time, you can do your job. He can do his job. It makes it just makes short form content easier. Yes. <sighs> That was an exhausting conversation, but hey, I learned a lot, and everything that I thought I could pull out of Tanmay, that I thought the audiences need to know, I got, and I'm very excited that Tanmay had the time to do this, and I hope you liked it. I'm gonna do just five of these. I'm gonna get the best in each industry, and I'm gonna learn from their insights, go very very deep. All you have to do is like, share, and subscribe. You know what I really like about OnePlus is not just the hardware; it's also software, like. They launched this thing called the OnePlus AI Music Studio. Okay. So I can go. I can select EDM. I can select romantic. I can select travel, and I just proceed. And I can describe the vibe. Three genres that have nothing to do with you, but sure. Yeah, but whatever. Let's say uh, under the city lights. What's that's the name of the song? I'm just writing something under the city lights, right? Uh, what should your song be about? And wait, it's going to just produce the track for you. That's what I like about OnePlus. It's not just the hardware. It's also like. They really think through the software, so even their OS and all looks so cool. Oh, it's ready. No way. Wow, it really feels like I'm under the city lights. Yeah. Ritwi is performing. I think they're doing a event. They're doing a festival. Dude, it makes a video also. That's sick. Sure. Look at this. It makes a video also. Oh, that's cool.